As we said, we are in Romans chapter 15, and we began last week in this chapter and studied, I think, through the first seven verses or so. Uh, as we said last week, we need to keep in mind how that the first part of Romans chapter 15 is kind of a continuation of Romans 14. And we mentioned how that men had put that division in there. And sometimes they can be unfortunate because it seems like they're the first few verses of Romans chapter 15 are just, a, you know, a direct continuation of the thoughts of what um, Paul was trying to say there in chapter 14. Toward the end of the chapter, he kind of changes years and speaks about himself and, you know, some of his plans and things like that. But, um, you know, the first part is pretty well a continuation of chapter 14. And we were saying that this was an exhortation to unity. And we talked a little bit last week about how that we are to please one another for the sake of Christ. And we asked the question, well, how can matters of indifference be solved? And of course, it says that in the very first verse of Romans chapter 15. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. And so this uh, this tactic, I, tactic, I guess you could say, or this this practice will go a long way to promoting unity within a congregation. Those who are strong bear with the scruples of those who are weak. And we talked about how that this may be different on different occasions, how that my strengths and your strengths are different. And so we may be going kind of back and forth and bearing with one another in different circumstances. And as long as we are all looking out for each other's welfare, then things go much better. And we saw how that being a Christian is not about doing what we want. It's not about me. Once we take on the banner of Christ or, or become a Christian, then we, we cease to live for ourselves. We live for Christ and therefore we live for others. And so we're, we're concerned with helping others and, and especially helping others reach heaven. There in verse two, it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And we want again, and I, this week I want to make mention of the fact that we are doing so for their good. This is something that is going to benefit our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. We're not doing so as a way to please them to get what they want in a selfish way. We're doing these things in a way that's going to edify this person. And of course, edification is the act of one who promotes another's growth and Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness. And so this is our goal. As we bear with the scruples of each other, we're doing so in a way that's going to strengthen and encourage and ultimately help this person get to heaven. We're not trying to uh, condone their weaknesses or, or trying to keep them in a weak state enable them to remain weak, we're trying to encourage and strengthen them by doing these things. And of course, we do so by following, when we do so, we follow the example of Christ, and we're going to get into that in a little more detail this morning as we look at the, the example of Christ. Uh, we talked about the Old Testament and how that the Old Testament is there for our encouragement. You know, quotes from the Old Testament, they have a purpose. Uh, they're there for a reason. They're not there just kind of as window dressing. You know, the Old Testament was written and preserved for, for our benefit. It warns us of the dangers of disobeying God. And there are many dangers that we can see, many, many instances during the Old Testament that we can read about and see, uh, you know, the path that, that people had walked and, and, and how they had failed and the results of that. And the Old Testament teaches us that. Uh, it reinforces, it teaches, you know, it illustrates the teachings of the New Testament and it reinforces the message of God. And so it's a very beneficial tool for, you know, the New Testament writers, but it's also a very beneficial tool for us today as we try to help others and try to help ourselves as we go and we take those passages and we can illustrate those things with the Old Testament and then we can reinforce the new law with this old law and, and this Old Testament. And then we ask the question, can we really be a proper Christian if we don't have a high regard for the Old Testament, if we're not a proper student and if we're not endeavoring to gain as much knowledge as we can about the Old Testament? I think that without a doubt, we 
understand that we need to be looking and studying the Old Testament as well. We looked at the goal of unity, how that we are called to offer patience and patience and comfort to one another and that God calls us to be of one mind. And then we looked at the purpose of this oneness and the main purpose of this oneness, of course, is to glorify God. And we glorify, we seek to glorify God in everything that we do. And if we are glorifying God, a direct result of that is we are going to be saved. If we're in a position, if we're living in a way that we are glorifying God, then we know that we're in a condition that we are going to make it to heaven. And so if we always seek to glorify God, then kind of the trickle down effect of that is everything else is going to be in line. And so we always seek to glorify God. All right, so that's kind of the review from last week. Does anybody have anything that they would like to uh, to add to that? Any questions or comments or anything along those lines? All right, as we move on into, uh, as we follow up there in verse 7, we're looking at the example of Christ and how the we are to follow the example of Christ. It says they are therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so he is encouraging them to receive each other as Christ had done. And so we look to the example of Christ to see what sort of pattern we need to follow in doing what Paul is encouraging the Romans and in turn encouraging, encouraging us to do. We look at Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verses 3 through 6. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good will of his pleasure, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted to the beloved. And so we see this, this nature of Christ and how, you know, he, he was accepting, he was loving, and how that, uh, you know, this, this idea of adoption, bringing us in, you know, we, we were on the outside and now we're being adopted in, into this family, into this church. And what that entails, you know, you take someone who really has no rights in a family and then bring them in and give them all the rights of someone who was born into the family. And so uh, this is this is kind of the example that we follow. Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And so here again, we have, you know, a list here as far as, you know, tender mercies, kindness, humility. You know, this is all kind of summed up, you know, in that last phrase, we are to love one another. The love, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And so if we possess the proper type of love for each other, the type of love that Christ had, you know, we are going to be motivated to ultimately, if, it call, if it's called for it, to, to lay down our life for one another, just as Christ did. And so we see that, you know, all of these things are very important. If we are to receive each other as Christ received us, then there's going to definitely have to be love. There's going to have to be humility. There's going to have to be mercy. You think about mercy. You know, what is that? That's not, you know, mercy is unmerited favor. Being kind to somebody even when they don't deserve. It. Uh, you know, long suffering. Sometimes we want people to move on a lot quicker than they do, but. We need to be long suffering as we deal with each other. And of course, the forgiving. You know, we have been forgiven. And so we must forgive as well if we hope to be forgiven of our sins. So, Christ, you know, if Christ receives us despite our weaknesses and our flaws, 
how can we be less tolerant with each other? Everyone in here has a weakness, probably more than one. Everyone in here has flaws. And Christ has received us, has accepted us in spite of those weaknesses and flaws. So how can we do any less with each other? If we expect Christ to look down on us and forgive us and accept us, and and like we said, there's no one in here that has not sinned, that has not fallen short. If we expect Christ to do that for us, how can we not do that for each other? And so we must receive each other as Christ received us. But we need to understand that we receive others in spite of their weaknesses, not in spite of their immoralities. And this is an important point when we're talking about chapter 14 and chapter 15, because there's a lot of false doctrine that is taught on these two chapters. And we need to understand that that we receive each other in spite of our weaknesses, but we don't receive each other in spite of immoralities and accept someone else's sin. That's not what we're called upon to do here. We have passages such as 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. It says, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. And so here we have this instruction to do what we commonly call withdraw fellowship from someone who is not walking in a way that they should. And so we see definitely that he's not telling us that we put up with, with an immoral person, saying, oh, he's just weak. You know, we, 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 we try to help that person. We try to correct that. We don't condone that. And ultimately, there comes a point where we may have to withdraw fellowship from that person. Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. And so, again, this just reiterates what we read, you know, a few verses earlier there that we do not condone sin. And that's not what Paul is is saying. And again, in in chapters 14 and 15, we need to consider the context. Always look at the context, see the train of thought, what he's speaking about. You know, back in chapter 14, we're not talking about anything that is sin. We're talking about differences in opinions that, that ultimately do not matter spiritually. They do not matter with God. And therefore, we have no right to bind or 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 anything of of that nature. And so we need to consider the context and we cannot condone sin. Anything that anybody would like to add to that there. There's even a warning. Back in Proverbs, chapter 20. Verse 19 says, He who goes about as a tail bearer will be secrets, therefore do not associate with one who flatters the lips. You can have men that just blurt out things that are on the truth. Yeah. Just tell them that. So don't associate with them. Yeah. And all through Proverbs, and you know, it's talking about not not being around people that are evil and being led astray by wicked people and, and things of that nature. And so, you know, we, we cannot condone those type of behaviors. Yes, David. Uh, back in verse 2, you're talking about you know, withdrawal from the brother or the sin. And, and I agree with all that. And I believe that. Would there be, would there be times that we should be more expedient about the sin than other times? that or, or should we always I realize we need to be long stuff and I don't mean it like that but I mean would it be sin and I realize sin is sin but there'd be some sin if someone done you know should we react you know should we have a different reaction as far as you know withdrawing from a brother depending on the type of sin it, 
was or I think when it comes to discipline, uh, you know, even disciplining our children or disciplining, you know, the church disciplining a, a brother or sister that we look at it, you know, as far as a case by case basis. And, uh, you know, a lot a lot needs to be considered there. Uh, you know, the maturity level of the Christian, maybe uh, the, the type of sin, how public the sin is. If we don't do something in a hurry, is this going to affect our standing in the community? Um, you know, there are, there are many things to consider there. And so, uh, you know, I would say that that we would look at it, like we said, a, a case by case basis. And there's just a lot to consider. You know, we, we don't want to uh, we want to do it in a way and we're going to be looking at this, uh, you know, as far as admonishing uh, in a way that's going to benefit, benefit the person involved as well as, you know, do our best to withhold our uh, standing in the community. And so uh, I think it could be could be different in different cases. Right. Yeah. Snatching them out of the fire. Yeah. Sometimes we're snatching them out of the fire. Yeah. We don't linger, but we, we have to deal with them. Yeah. Sometimes there is a case where. Yeah. Let me read it. That's what I was. And on some, and there's no doubt about it, that on some of the Jews were taken to the making a distinction. So yes, we make a distinction on some. But others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that I by the play. Yeah, I, I was thinking of that verse in my mind, but I could not pull up where it was at. So I'm glad you I'm glad you got that. So that verse definitely speaks to what you're what you're talking about. What, I had thought of that. I, I wasn't mm-hmm. thinking that when I asked the question. It's just like with with a child, you know, we, we would react differently with a child maybe who, you know, we, we told to stay in the bench and he went around and sat in the bench behind him versus a child who we still told to stay in the bench and he's running toward this highway out from. You know, one calls for a, a more drastic interaction. <laughs> you know, we're going to you know, probably yell, get their attention, you know, things like that to, to pull them away from from that situation. And sometimes, you know, as a brother or sister, we dealing with those, we may need to do that. And I think that goes to what Rodney and Rex have said in that verse, you know, just different situations. Anything else anybody would like to say? That's, that's a good question. All right, so we see... God's plan, and that is unity through Christ. You know, Christ came first to the Jews, yet he did not come to the Jew alone. As proof, he cites these uh, Old Testament passages. If we pick up reading there in Romans 15, starting there in verse 8, it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, all him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him. The Gentiles shall hope. And so we see that the Jews play a prominent role in God's plan of salvation. You look back at the lineage of Christ, you know, we're, we're tracing that lineage through through David and, you know, all the way back to, to Abraham's, Abraham and, and all of those fathers. And, you know, that promise was given to them. And so definitely the Jews played a part and it was an important part. It was a very important part. Yet, you know, there there was this admonition, you know, you do not need to feel superior. You do not need to feel superior because Christ came 
to save the Gentiles as well. And then we have this admonition kind of to the, to the Gentiles. Well, don't you know, you, you don't get a big head as well because Christ came first to whom? The Jews. He came through the Jewish lineage and it was to the Jews that Christ went first. And so ultimately what we have uh, is no attitude of superiority with anybody. It's this idea of unity through Christ. Christ came to save both Jew and Gentile. And so no one has the right to feel superior. No one has the right to brag or, or, or to laud any part of this over another. Because there is no difference. There is no difference in Christ. God's plan. Unity through Christ. Unity through Christ. And, you know, this this evens out the playing field. Evens it out. There, there's there's no no one's above any, anyone else in, you know, lineage and position as far as social position. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are. It doesn't matter. We're all one and we're all the same in Christ. Any comments there? said this, but unity in Christ through the will of God or through the gospel of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that's ultimately where we where we find that. Even in the teaching of first Corinthians three, seven, Paul so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. Yeah. That's right. We'll have that passage Lord willing here in just a in just a few minutes, but it's good good to Good to get those in there. It's not, it's nothing that anybody, anybody does. It's God who's going to give the increase. And so unity through Christ and then hope. Hope is a great thing. Hope is a powerful thing. We read there in verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this idea of abounding in hope, this hope filling us with joy, hope is a powerful thing. God is the God of hope. He gives us hope. We look at the definition of hope. What is that? Joyful and confident expectation. You know, I've used this, this illustration in in the past, you know, talking about sometimes we, we use hope in a sense that, uh, that that it's not necessarily used in the New Testament. You know, I may say, well, I, I hope I don't lose any more of my hair. Well, that's a desire I have, but I really have no expectation that that's going to come true. I feel like before long, I'm going to look like some others in here. And so I may have that desire. It's not a real hope. It's not a hope in the sense that we have hope in Christ. Because the hope that God gives us is a confident expectation. I am confident I will receive this. And therefore I can take joy. I can take strength. I can build myself up as well as help build others up. All because of this hope that we have that comes from God through Christ. First Peter chapter one and verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Psalms 146 and verse five. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is the Lord his God. It was Paul's prayer that they have all joy and peace in their faith and an abundance of hope. Joy comes from the realization of what we have received from God. We can have the peace because of our justification. We can go back and look at, you know, all the studies that we had on justification and things of that nature. But, you know, there is there is a great amount of joy. 
that we can derive from this, this idea of justification. Now we are justified because of Christ. And the hope that we have because of that, now we can stand before God clean. We can, we can be clean because of the blood of Christ. Because we have been justified by that blood. That offers us joy. That offers us hope. That offers us peace. And we can have peace with each other. Because the love that we have for each other, the love we have for God, causes us to interact with each other in a way that promotes peace with each other. That helps us to overcome our differences. It helps, it helps us to, to cope or, or to, uh, you know, to deal with the scruples that, that others may have. Hebrews 6, verses 10 through 12. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And so let's not become sluggish. And one way we can overcome this, this tendency to become sluggish is to not forget the hope that we have. Not forget, not, not take our eyes off of the prize. What's our goal? Our goal is to live in heaven with God for eternity and to take as many people as we can with us. That's our goal. That's the hope that we have. We can be sure of that. And so let's keep our eye on that. Let's not become sluggish. Let's not let our love for our brothers and sisters and our neighbor begin to fade over time. Let's continue to be diligent to assist those, to love each other, to bear with the weaknesses and, and overcome these things to the best of our ability. That kind of finishes up that section. Does anybody have anything they would like to say or comments or anything? All right, in verse 14, we kind of switch gears a little bit, and Paul begins to speak about the, the confidence that he has in the Roman brethren. You know, the confidence that he has developed for them. In verse 14, it says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. And so we see that Paul was confident and we look at the source of Paul's confidence. And we may think, well, this confidence is a little bit unusual because when we go back to verse 13 of chapter 1, we see Paul had not actually ever met these brethren in person. He says, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I, have, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So Paul is stating here that he had wanted to see them, wanted to come to them, but he, he had never been able to. He had not been able to. So how did he have this confidence? How was this confidence brought about? Well, the faith of the Roman church was widely known. You look there in verse 8. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And so they had a good reputation, didn't they? Throughout the whole world, the faith of the Roman church had been spoken of. In the last chapter, chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And so a lot of lessons can be learned from this, but I think the importance of having a good reputation as a congregation is, is pointed out here. And that the faith of a congregation can go a long way in encouraging others, other congregations and in, in other places, as well as, you know, even across the world. And so, you know, 
we want to we want to have the right relationship with each other so that we can be strong here, but yet we need to have the same sort of reputation or endeavor to that the Roman church had. Where Paul can have this confidence in that church and had never actually met them in person. And so I think this speaks very highly of the Roman church. And of course, this was a compliment to the church as a whole. I don't think he's necessarily complimenting each individual there. But this was a compliment of the church as a whole, even though that there were some issues there. Issues that could be overcome if they were willing to work on that. But, you know, the faith was there. And we need to endeavor to have that as well. And so we see the source of Paul's confidence. What about the substance of Paul's confidence in the Roman, Roman church? First of all, he says they were full of goodness. Look at the definition of goodness. It's uprightness of heart and life kindness. That's how strong defines goodness. Uprightness of heart and life kindness. So we, we're doing what we need to do, do for ourselves personally, but yet we're kind to others. It's not just about me, remember. It's about my interaction with, with others. We see that goodness is a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And of course, all of these things, all of these fruit go a long way in our relationship with each other as well as those of the world. But definitely, goodness and kindness play a huge role in that. Goodness is essential for a Christian as they interact with other people. He also says that they were filled with all knowledge. Of course, knowledge of God's will is an essential part of having the hope that we discussed there in verse 13. But knowledge of God's will is also essential in us maintaining proper relationships with each other. Because we need to understand, you know, boundaries in those relationships and, and things of that nature. And so we need to feel, be filled with all knowledge. You look at the misapplication of Romans 14 and 15. And so, you know, relationships can 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 be skewed there if, if you just take these things out of context and, and do not really have the knowledge of God's entire word so that you properly understand how to apply Romans 14 and 15. Look at James chapter one, verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed in your relationships, your family relationship, as well as your relationships with Christians, as well as those of the world. Well, you know, look into the to the perfect will of God, into his law, the perfect law of liberty, and then continue in that. Have this knowledge, be filled with knowledge. And you'll be blessed in those relationships. You'll be blessed in everything. But relationships would be a part of that. Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. For this reason we also since the day we heard it. Do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. And all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing him. Being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. And so, so much about our walk as a Christian hinges on our knowledge of his word. How we interact, how we, you know, just the things that we do, the places that we go. So much of it hinges on a proper knowledge of God's word. So we need to be filled with goodness, but that goodness needs to be accompanied by knowledge. Knowledge of God's will. And then we see that they had the ability to admonish one another. 
it was there, that ability to admonish. And so we look at the definition of admonish. It says to caution or reprove gently, to warn. And so I was looking at that, you know, that word there in the definition, the idea of, of doing so gently. You know, we are to be continually admonishing one another in, in different ways. But this isn't a, you know, beating somebody over the head with something. This, this is kind of a gentle, gentle thing going on, a gentle push or a continual, continual thing going on. You know, we, we may need to pull somebody from the fire like we were saying, but that's probably kind of a rare thing. But with our daily walk with God and, and, and our daily walk with our brothers and sisters, this idea of admonishing is more of a gentle thing. And there again, we, we come, you know, love and, and patience and long suffering, all that comes into play. So as we live each other, with each other from day to day, this idea of admonishing this, this, this gentle encouragement is essential. And when we look at being able to admonish one another, you know, those first two things come into play as well. This idea of goodness plus a knowledge of God's will. How, how, can, we, how can we admonish someone properly if we don't have a proper knowledge of what we are doing? And so that's our responsibility to each other. Colossians 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Lord willing, in a few minutes, we're going to admonish one another as we sing. You know, we may be doing some admonishing at the conclusion of the service as we leave. The elders may admonish us to maybe our upcoming Bible study next week online. We, we may be encouraged and admonished to, to uh, try to spread the word there. To, to make this thing, you know, even though it's new and we're not really sure how it's, but, but we need to get out and we need to make some efforts. And so there may be some admonishing going on at that point. And so all of these, they're, 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 they're pushes, they're nudges, they're, they're, they're things that we can do. and Things that we can accept from each other. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn the, those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. So we have this warning, we have this comforting, we have upholding, and patience permeating all of that. And so what was the substance of Paul's confidence in the Roman church? They were filled with goodness. They were filled with all knowledge. They had the ability and looked like the desire to admonish one another. So that's a good pattern for us to follow. Do we want to be known throughout all the world as a, congrega as a, as a, as a congregation with great faith like the Roman congregation? I think we do. Paul gave us a pattern in this one verse. And of course, we could probably preach a lesson or more than one lesson on each one of these points. But there's a pattern for us if we want to be like the Roman church. We're out of time. We didn't quite get through what I had prepared for us. So Lord willing, week after next, we will continue with our study here. Next week, Wes will be speaking to us during the class class period. So. Of course, we're looking forward to that. So I appreciate everyone's attention as well as participation. We'll take us just a couple of minutes to swap things up here and then we'll go right into our song service.